You are listening to the Hostage to the Devil podcast. Some listeners may find this content disturbing. He was just the most fascinating person I'd ever met in my life. What? Gotta get him. He was Malachi Martin. There's one Malachi Martin. He drew you in. Very, very charming. He's a warrior. He was a warrior for God, and he still is a warrior for God. He was a great mythomaniac, in fact. He was just a, a liar and a scoundrel and a cheat. And good evening. Tonight we have a very special guest who it is my true honor and pleasure to have made his acquaintance. He's considered to be one of the most knowledgeable experts on the Vatican in the world. He is, uh, first of all, a very eminent theologian, expert on the Catholic Church, former Jesuit and professor at the Vatican's Pontifical Biblical Institute. He's the author of the national bestsellers, Vatican, The Final Conclave, Hostage to the Devil, and the Jesuits. He's also an exorcist. From about my third year in New York, I got uh, engaged in exorcism. And that was by sheer accident. One night I was rung up by a priest who was in the middle of an exorcism, and his assistant collapsed. So he asked me to put on my clothes and come over. It was 2 o'clock in the morning, and uh, come over to the, uh, to the Bronx. And then that started an association, so I've been in that field for quite a while. I got very interested in the subject of Satanism, and as they call him in America, Old Scrat himself. Episode 1, The Beginning and Development of a Passion Project. My name is Marty Stalker, I'm the director and co-writer of Hostage to the Devil. As a filmmaker, you're constantly having to respond and solve problems, and I'm hoping this podcast will be quite a therapeutic process for me, and get a few things off my chest to re-engage with people who helped me make the film. As it was quite a long process for me, I think all in it was about six years. So you could say Maliki Martin has been a part of my life for those whole six years and we only scratched the surface with the documentary and for me personally I'm, I'm on some sort of I wouldn't say a spiritual journey but I'm starting to really see things clearer in my personal life in my line of work in local issues worldly issues and also otherworldly issues and I just feel it's the best time to crack open the archives and start listening to the words of Maliki Martin again there was a great urge in the 60s at that meeting of the bishops. There were 2,800 of them, by the way, gathered in St. Peter's for three years. Now, this is Vatican II you're talking Vatican about. Vatican II, from 1962 to 1965. The spirit amongst them and fomented by the popes in question and by the cardinals, and the cardinals are very important officials around the pope, the spirit amongst them was, at all costs, at all means, let's get with the world. Just a little bit about myself for the audience who don't know. I'm originally from Liverpool. This is my posh radio voice. Grew up in the 80s. Grew up in a house surrounded by movies. I think we were the first family in the area who had a, the Betamax player. So friends would come to the house, flock to the house, in fact, and watch the classics. Did the whole cliche filmmaker thing where I worked in a video shop from the age of 16. And at 21, I was a qualified high school teacher and a Royal Marine commander. And I achieved my Green Beret in the summer of 2001. See, I'm quite lucky. I've had two passions in life. A passion for filmmaking and also a passion for soldiering. But I knew I needed to get the soldiering out the way first whilst I had a, you know, workable knees and a fairly intact back. So fast forward to 2008 after operational tours in Iraq and Afghanistan and I'm setting up home in Northern Ireland with my soon-to-be Irish wife. This was the opportunity now to start pursuing a career in filmmaking. So we get to 2012 and I was approached by two producers from Causeway Pictures, Paddy and Chris. They wanted me to come on board the Maliki Martin documentary project. And I can tell you now I bit the hand off at the opportunity. And here is Paddy the producer now talking about how Maliki Martin originally fell on his own radar. I was, as, as an awful lot of things, I met a guy in a pub who had been reading one of the Maliki Martin books. And he said, Paddy, you need to look at this guy. This is, you know, this is Indiana Jones stuff. Subsequently, I said this to Chris, and Chris went off and read some of the books, and he said, well, you know, there's something here. And we sort of knocked it around for a bit, and we started, you know, Margaret got involved in doing some research on it, and it sort of grew, and it grew, and it grew. And it was like, what the hell do we do with it? We need to sort of put some structure on this. And I think you got involved at that point. It was like, well, we have so much bloody stuff now, and, you know, if we, the more we go, or more of the onion we peel, 
the, the next layer and it's without direction you know there's no yeah. and that's when we sort of start talking about well let's do a feature doc and just focus us on an end result the objective was set find a narrative arc and storyline for a 90 minute feature documentary about maliki martin it was during the numerous rabbit holes that we went down during the research phase where we received an email from a Robert. He got wind of the project via social media and was keen to talk to us. This was the first of many Skype calls with Robert in March of 2013. Yeah. There we go. I, I see all of you, gentlemen. So uh, you got uh, you have me, you have Chris with the glasses, Marty with the beard, the other beard. <laughs> hey guys, it's, it's nice to make your acquaintance. You've obviously done your research. Marty, I saw the little bit you had on the, uh, the internet. And in there, it, there's a photograph of him kneeling at what looks like the, uh, the foot of a prelate. Actually, I took that photo. No way. I, I became known among his circle of friends as his driver, for better or worse, because he didn't have a car of his own. Frequently, yeah. he had to go to places that mass transit didn't reach. He would always call me up, and he would say, he knew me as uh, Bob, and he would say, Bob, tell me this. And at that moment, I knew a request oh. to drive him somewhere was coming. I literally, I took him... Everywhere, Connecticut, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and even sometimes we went down to, uh, to New York. I was always happy to do it because I got the chance to spend hours and hours with him on every subject under the sun. He was an exorcist. I actually accompanied him to several of them. I did not want to be present for the actual exorcisms themselves. Yeah. If any of you gentlemen have seen any video of an authentic exorcism you would know my reluctance yeah we've looked at we've looked at hours of this stuff and it's just not it's not very pleasant it's not it's not but the best window in fact marty the best window i can give you into the whole topic of exorcism that you've probably already looked at is hostage to the devil yeah yeah okay he never told me which one it was but he was one of the priests under pseudonym in one of the five stories in there okay. so you it's up to you to do your detective work on that <laughs> Yeah. He told me that the most important parts of that book were, towards the end, the chapters entitled Humans and Jesus, and I think Humans and Lucifer, and the relationship and the dynamic between them. So I was told directly to my face by a senior Jesuit in Milltown in Dublin that I would not be allowed to make this film. Ireland is not a theocracy, so the last time I checked, you're free to make the movie. Oh, I know, oh, I know this, I know this. The reason why that... Jesuit, and I don't know whom you're referring to, would have told you that is because as you guys do your due diligence, you're going to find out that in the 1960s, after the Second Vatican Council, the religious order known as the Jesuits, which had always been historically seen as the Pope's most loyal soldiers, if you will, they completely went off in a different direction. In his book, The Jesuits, he basically laid out chapter and verse where the Jesuit train went off the tracks, and they didn't like that at all. And Maliki saw that they were embracing every radical left-wing fad of the day to the point where he went to His Holiness, Pope Paul VI, and requested permission to be released from two of his three vows. The one vow that remained was chastity. There, there's more I'm prepared to tell you, gentlemen, when you come to New York mm -hmm. about him. Yeah. I'm just willing to do it over an yeah. international Skype line. Yep. And that's that's alluding to the, the threats that Patty were apparently made to you that you would not be permitted to make this film. Luckily, I found myself in New York City in May that same year, so I nipped over to Robert's office with a rucksack filled with cameras and microphones for a test recording. He was extremely engaging, and soon we found out that he wasn't just Maliki's driver and friend, but he himself had a secret past. My background is, right now, I'm a financial services executive working in anti-money laundering. I've been doing that for approximately the past 14 years. And prior to that, since 1984, I was uh, an operations officer with the Central Intelligence Agency. And it was while I was an operations officer with the Central Intelligence Agency that I first crossed paths with uh, Father Maliki. Around the corner from us here on 43rd Street is the Church of St. Agnes. It used to be a beautiful old Gothic wooden church and it burned down and was replaced by the marble church that's there now. But that's one of the only places in New York that back in 1990 
had the old traditional Roman Latin mass. And I went there one day, and do you remember the infamous episode when Sinead O'Connor appeared on Saturday Night Live, and she ripped up the Pope, picture the Pope saying we had to fight the enemy? Well, the priest who gave the sermon the next day gave a rather fiery response to Sinead O'Connor because he said if it was the Muslims or the Jews who had one of their dear religious leaders you know, uh, insulted like that on national television, they would be stoning Rockefeller Center right now. He says, but the Catholics, he says, we're sheeple. We just turn the other cheek every time. So I kind of went back into the sacristy afterwards, and I kind of congratulated him on basically having the guts to give a sermon like that. His name was Father John Perricone. We struck up a friendship, and one night over some cheap Chinese food on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, I had mentioned I was reading a book called The Keys of This Blood by Malachi Martin. And he just piped up, oh, I know Father Malachi. Would you like to meet him? And having read Hostage to the Devil when I was in high school, I said, well, absolutely, of course. So he actually arranged a dinner at a restaurant here on the Upper East Side called the Isle of Capri. And it was myself, Father Perricone, Malachi, and about six other young seminarians. And Father Malachi was seated at the head of this small table. And I was immediately on his right at the corner. And he asked, it was funny because he asked me, he said, where did you get your college education? I said, I went to Catholic University down in Washington, and he kind of grabbed my forearm in mock astonishment and said, my God, man, and you're still Catholic. <laughs> so, and we had a great conversation that night, and what I did was I told Father Perricone at the end of the evening that, you know, I would just like to be able to drop him a thank you note because he picked up the tab, which came to about $400, which I thought was very nice. He picked up the tab, and I sent him a thank you note and I said, the best way I know to say thank you is to, re is to uh, reciprocate with a good meal. So if you'd like to be my guest some evening at a nice Italian restaurant here in the city, just name the date and time and I'll be there. And that was on a Monday, Friday afternoon. Little red light on my answering machine is blinking when I get home from work. And it's Malachi. And he was saying he would love to have dinner with me. And please give him a call on his private line. And we sh that was back in 1990 summer 1990, and we struck up a great friendship. So that's how I came to know Father Martin. His stories about Malachi were incredible, particularly the story about his last exorcism of a four-year-old girl. It was such a powerful account that I knew we just had to have this event somewhere featured in the film. We got to the psychiatrist's house. I was supposed to drop him off there about an hour before the family arrived driving in from Michigan. And by unfortunate coincidence, we both arrived there at the same time. And I will never forget, till the end of my days, the assurance, the self-confidence of this child. She walked up to Malachi, and she spoke to him in the third person. And she just looked right up at him and she said, your father Malachi, and you think you can help her. Having never laid eyes on him in her life. And then the other thing was, she just radiated something bad. I mean, I wouldn't look at her and say, you know, she was possessed by the devil. I'm not competent to make that judgment. But I'd seen a lot of crazy things during my time with the U.S. government. And I knew when, you know, that sense was tingling, going off, saying, this is not a situation you want to be in. It was an unlikely pairing. You've got a young, dark-haired, Italian-looking CIA officer driving around with a small, wiry-framed Irish former Jesuit priest in his religious garb and Robert had retained so much knowledge that Malachi had passed on to him. He was just a great source to tap into. He disclosed that they talked about everything from the third secret of Fatma, demonic possession, obsession, to normally priestly conversations. Over time, I knew that the audience would find him fascinating, sometimes find him over the top, but for me, he was credible, and ultimately, he was a believer in Malachi. After our catch-up in New York City in May, Robert went off the grid. Communication ceased. I initially thought that he had developed cold feet about the project, but he finally made contact four weeks later. Now, it was important for me not to get too carried away with the coincidences of what he told me on the call, but this was a man who 100% believed that his physical involvement in the project was now a cause for concern for his own safety. He believed it was powers not of this world trying to stop him from being involved in the documentary. You and I had met that day, midday, up in my offices in Manhattan, right up around Grand Central Station, as I recall. And uh, that day was the first time I'd been on camera for the project. And going home, I was on Route 9 in 
New Jersey. It's a very famous highway here in the New York area. And I was at a red light, and I was listening to a Yankees game on the radio, and, you know, this woman came up behind me in a big minivan and hit me at about 50 miles an hour. And I was at a dead stop. And, you know, something like that happens. No brake noises, no tires squealing, no nothing. You know, the impact, 50 miles an hour into a vehicle that is stopped, pretty significant. You know, thank God that there was someone from the Orthodox Jewish Hatzola Brooklyn Medical Service on his way up Route 9 from the Orthodox community down in Lakewood, New Jersey, on his way for his evening shift at work, who saw the accident happen. And he broke out my rear driver's side window, and I just only have a very foggy memory of this heavily accented Jewish voice telling me that he was just holding my head upright until the paramedics arrived. And then the next thing I remember, um, I'm in the hospital, lying there on a stretcher, looking up at a very large African-American doctor and my wife, whose eyes were as big as saucers. And, you know, I just, I was in immense pain. And the doctors looked at me and he said, you are very lucky to be alive. He says that, that accident, that crash, would have killed most people. And it was only a few days afterwards, you know, I didn't experience pain at first because the doctor said, you won't, you're in shock. And then afterwards I began experiencing, you know, the, the pain in my back, the, the shattered vertebrae in my lower spine and a couple of uh, herniated discs in my, my lower spine and in my neck, traumatic brain injury, etc. cetera. And I, I actually, you know, once the magnitude of what had happened kind of uh, made itself evident. Once that magnitude made itself evident, I asked my pastor and I told him the circumstances. And he, yes, he was very forthright. He says, you were being warned not to continue your participation in any project about Malachi Martin. You're being warned, stop or it could get worse. And I didn't stop, as you know, I didn't stop. And the things that devolved from that first accident, you know, I'm still dealing with today, and it's going on nine years and 10 months later, certain disabilities arising from it. Uh, for example, uh, I have very little, if any, feeling in my right forearm and hand to the point where I can't really use a computer anymore. And I can only maybe sign my name about five times before it starts to look like a young child playing with crayons. And there's nothing really to be done with it. My surgeon, my orthopedic surgeon said, no, it's just, this is as a long-term result of the accident you were in. He said, you just kind of have to deal with it. He says, I'm not going to blow smoke at you. Some people are dealt a tougher hand in poker than others. You drew a tougher hand. As opposed to uh, the second incident, I think it was like about two years later, my memory is a little hazy on it, but I had gone uh, to pick up some materials related to the film for you gents up at my parents' house in northern New Jersey. And once again, uh, I, was at a, I was at a stop and a woman in a car came up behind me and struck me. And again, she said she never saw me. And I go back to my first sentence. How do you not see a Nissan Xterra at a stop? Because in addition to this big hulking gray SUV, you've got the bright brake lights, bright red brake lights staring you in the face. Fortunately, that impact was not as severe as the first accident. They did have me checked out via ambulance. But the all it did was it kind of amplified the effects of the first accident didn't cause anything new. So in that respect, it was good. But it, you know, it, it left its mark and it, it definitely made me realize that the preternatural is not something to be trifled with. Which is why, you know, it, to go off on a tiny tangent here, now I see it's, it's very popular for these people to engage in going out and doing ghost shows and ghost hunting and they literally have no idea what they're doing. They think because they wave around a holy metal and talk in a commanding voice that the preternatural world is theirs to control or will obey them. And I'm just thinking to myself, if you only had a clue, you would quit this TV series forever. But they don't. And I can't, I can't help but be a little bit amused by it because there's prices to be paid. There's always a price to be paid. 
Now, it wasn't long until I was speaking to Ralph Sarcher on the phone. He originally wasn't interested in being involved in the documentary. Naturally, he took a long time to warm up to me, but I think that's the norm with Ralph. Like most of Maliki's friends, he was protective of keeping his mentor's legacy safe. But the morning after one of our calls, he felt like he had to be involved, and what he brought to the table was extremely important. He passed an archive of Maliki Martin that nobody had ever seen before. I'm glad that I'm going to be judged by our Lord Jesus, because I don't be judged by any man. I'd be condemned to hell by any decent person, because I'm a filthy thing. I have to my life. Yeah, yeah, I know me. I know me better than anybody, and I know I don't deserve a darn thing. Sir. I'd also spent just as much time on the phone with Bob Kaiser, a former Jesuit priest turned journalist and author himself, a very vocal critic of Malachi Martin. He was even more cautious of my intentions and called me out on one occasion when he asked me what my own thoughts of Malachi were. I tried my best to slide my way out of the question by telling him that I remained on the fence with my views of the man. I can still hear his laugh now down the phone at me. But he was right. How was I going to make a documentary about this man without coming to some sort of conclusion myself? He became such a close friend that I invited him out to our beach villa and uh, one thing led to another, and he seduced my wife. I didn't want to think that. I denied it to myself for a long time. He loved women. He should have been a politician. His only intimacy with the, with the devil was perhaps personal. We finished off the call with an ultimatum from Bob. I must read his book, Clerical Error, A True Story, before we spoke again. So the book was ordered and delivered soon after, and it was added to the books already piling up on my desk. And I soon got back to my research, listening to critics and speaking to friends of Maliki Martin. He loved to tickle the conspiracy bone. He was kind of like a traditional Catholic Tom Clancy. You know, he, he entertained he, people. Yeah. Well, he certainly did. And, and he was an excellent writer. There's, there's, there's no question about it. And like Christ created controversy. Like he was so wonderful, yet there were people that hated him. Really, he is a liar of all liars. He's a sociopath. He has no sense of morality at all. Says whatever he wants to say. He, he is he's a seducer. He's an adulterer. He's a murderer. He's a destroyer. And he is one of the main architects of um, the Vatican II, Vatican II Church. People were jealous of him because of his success as an author, as a spokesman about the church. And I said, so why didn't you more aggressively fight back? And he smiled at me. He said, Rob, I'm an author. I make my money by how many books I sell. So in that instance, there's no such thing as bad publicity when you want to keep yourself in the limelight. There's always going to be that element out there, whatever they're motivated by, who are going to hate for hating's sake. As far as the church goes, I think he was definitely one of our best and brightest. You know, by just speaking publicly, by telling people the truth, he was very charismatic in, in his love for God and, and his hatred for Satan. I know I miss him terribly because issues that have come up in my life that in the past I could ask him and get a really, really discerning answer. I can't do that anymore. And many people, probably thousands of people, feel the same way. Father Malachi Martin, in my view, to use an old cliche, was a mystery wrapped up in an enigma. A man of immense charm, immense intelligence, but also a man of mystery. The demons that we've battled before are, are stronger. They're staying longer. They're fighting harder. It's a very popular subject today, but no one is picking any real leadership role in it, and it's very dangerous to go out and start to dabble in this um, because you're going to open windows and open doors, and there still is a terrible loss of faith today. And Satan is showing his hand. He's having his free reign and free will right now, I think, to just go after everybody, you know, in the attempt to take their soul. He's out there right now, every day, every minute, every second, trying to collect souls. He will do whatever it takes to get them. And people are falling prey to him because of how we are today in society. You know, our lack of faith, our our wanting more, you know, being greedy, you know. He knew what was coming. He saw what was coming. And he tried to warn us about it and became public. And because he became public, you know, there were, there were many that thanked him for it, and there were also many that ri- ridiculed him for it. Father Martin would be facing 
the the battles of his life. There's no one like him today. The producers had managed to rustle up a bit of cash for us to head over to Rome in May 2014. Now, I couldn't make a documentary about exorcism without going to a hot spot like Italy. And during our time there, we managed to grab several interviews with the country's finest exorcists. I was surprised how much access they gave us, and the week was jam-packed, including an interview with Father Cesar Trucqui, a protege of the mighty Father Gabriel Amorf. As I told you before, I think that among exorcists, there are two schools. The first one, the very shy ones, the, those who want to keep low profile, we need to be prudent, etc. I don't like those. I respect them. I don't like them. Why? Because you're not doing weird things. You're not a crazy guy. You're a man of faith, and you're trying to promote faith and, uh, and to prevent people on these things. So you have Father Martin in Ireland in the United States. You have in Italy Father Amorth. In the United States, you have also fa- Father Gary Thomas that he became famous for the book of the right for the novel. And so I would, I would prefer many priests like this. But if this priest, like Father Martin or Father Amorth, they're strong in their faith, they know what they're saying, and they, they don't want to cause a scandal, but they just want to tell the truth. Hallelujah, my friend. We want those because it's the best opportunity to evangelize. It's a great instrument to help out people to know that the devil exists, yes, but we are also telling people that God exists, that God is more powerful, that love is more powerful than evil. And so for me, we need many, many Father Martins. Whilst in Rome, we also bagged interviews with Matt Baglio, the author of Argo on the right, The Making of a Modern Exorcist, and an interview with Paddy Agnew, a Vatican reporter who unfortunately didn't make the cut. The idea that people could become possessed by the devil remains part of Catholic teaching, as indeed it is part of Islam, as part of Hinduism, as part of Buddhism. But the Vatican doesn't actually have its official exorcist. I used to think it did, but it doesn't. That doesn't mean that there aren't organizations such as, say, uh, the Regina Apostolorum here in Rome, where they have a whole exorcism department and they deal with it. The Vicariato of Rome, the the Vicarage of Rome, they have uh, Father Gabriele Mort. There was one moment that stood out for me during the trip, and that was when we organized an interview with Italian exorcist Father Don Aldo Buenetto. We received the heads up that it was going to be in Italian, so Paddy, the producer, got to work charming our neighbor into helping us translate the interview. When we arrived for the recording, Donaldo was accompanied by another man. I'd clocked his concealed handgun straight away, and when I asked the priest who he was, he smiled and informed me that it was his personal assistant. As the interview went on and we learned more about the priest's battle with the occult in Italy and the vast amounts of death threats he had received, it became obvious that the personal assistant was really there for his own personal safety. So that's the end of episode one. Please tune into episode two where we look at the main production in America, the edit, and getting the film on Netflix. And it would only be wise to finish off with the main man himself. What can we do as people what do we do to defend against this or, you know, how do we prepare for this? What do we do? Your own life, personal life, first of all. Be clean. Observe the law. Take your beliefs and refurbish them. Take your faith out of your pocket and polish it up if it's a coin. And uh, make sure you live according to your principles and not according to the passions that uh, the, the, the corrupt world around us dictate. That's all you can do, really. Then, if you function as a doctor, as a lawyer, as a priest, as a clergyman, as a husband, whatever it is, enables you to help people to see the truth and to not live by lies and dishonesty, yeah, that you're supposed to do that. But there's not much else you can do except find the grace of God. If you haven't got the grace of God, go and ask God for it. <laughs>